The 21st century was supposed to be the Chinese century. China was supposed to displace and replace the US as the sole superpower by 2050. At least that was the great dream of President Xi Jinping of China. But that's not going to happen. There are a number of problems. China has failed to wean the global South nations away from the US. It's failing to stand up to the US. It's antagonizing Russia. It's failing to make India toe its line in BRICS. It's antagonizing India as well. The world is rejecting the Belt and Road Initiative. The Maritime Silk Road isn't going anywhere. China's economic system is failing. China is losing credibility. The world mistrusts and fears China. China's total fertility rate, the TFR, has dropped below 1.1 which is a catastrophe by any uh, yardstick a desperate china could lash out and go to war with within this decade with uh, taiwan maybe india maybe japan maybe even the us a time of rapid geopolitical change and great uncertainty looms ahead please subscribe and let's find out what exactly is happening this video is sponsored by West Haven Gold. Here is their stock ticker on the screen. It's WHN on the TSX Venture Exchange. So China's economy was doing well until roughly 2017. We know that the US aided and abetted China's so-called peaceful rise. The US uh, took China's side in 1969 when it came to choosing between Russia, between the USSR and China during the Cold War. And from the 1980s, 1990s onwards, the Chinese economy grew rapidly in a very impressive way because of the manufacturing that was outsourced to China by the West, primarily the US. So it was the US that midwifed and aided and abetted China's so-called peaceful economic rise. And then we arrive to we arrive at January 2018. That's where the US China trade war begins, January 2018. And this begins with the Trump administration setting tariffs and trade barriers on China. And the goal was to force China to make changes to what the US and to what Trump said were long-standing unfair trade practices and intellectual property theft by China. The Chinese government accused the Trump administration of engaging in nationalist protectionism and they took retaliatory action. So there were, you know, so there was this trade war that started and we are still in the middle of it. And Mr. Trump's successor, Mr. Biden, has kept these tariffs in place and he has gone above and beyond that in this trade war with China. Then we have the great event of 2019-2020, which is the coronavirus pandemic that essentially shut the world down for two or three years. This was the, the terrible event that happened beginning late 2019. That's why it's called the COVID-19 virus. And China had this draconian zero COVID policy, uh, which caused a drastic, terrible economic slowdown in China. The GDP growth went into the, into the red. It went negative. And there were months after months of these harsh lockdowns all across China, the zero COVID policy. And after a certain point, people reached their breaking point and then you have protests. So there were these white paper protests in China. The, the protesters wanted uh, to end zero COVID. They said, we want human rights. We, we And they said, down with the Communist Party, which is something if you say in China, it's only be after you have reached, you've gone past your breaking point. So there were these protests against the zero COVID policy. Like, like I said, the manufacturing was affected very badly and China's reputation was affected. First of all, because China was the originator of this virus right the virus was first discovered and it was it was first found in wuhan the city of wuhan and then there's the skull degree the skull degree that china played with the world health organization so typically when a new virus uh, is discovered it's named after the place where it is first found found like the nipah virus the west nile virus the ebola virus and so on and so forth but this virus instead of being named the wuhan virus was named covid-19 because of the chinese because of the influence the chinese had at the who the world health foundation so this is something that the whole world noticed and it wasn't, you know, they, they broke with established procedure because of Chinese pressure and influence. Yeah. So that's something that uh, did not quite go well with uh, commentators across the world. Then there's the fact that the Chinese vaccine did not work. It's the worst performing vaccine 
among possibly all vaccines that were developed worldwide, the Sinovac or whatever it was called. And this vaccine was exported by China to certain countries, several countries, and it was a disaster there. So that, uh, you know, tarnished China's reputation greatly. They can't even manufacture a proper vaccine. And that's where India stepped in with its vaccine diplomacy, the vaccine Maitri. India sent as many doses of vaccines as any country needed, especially the, the global, South, global South nations. And India sent these vaccines for free. So that that's where India stepped in and and uh, you know uh, trumped China significantly, and the the fact that the Chinese vaccine did not work at all or it worked very poorly was what caused the Chinese government to implement this draconian zero COVID policy. So so that's what happened, and because of this, the entire economy took a severe downturn. There was this proper there is this ongoing property sector crisis in China, which dates which which has its origins not in the COVID pandemic but before that, there's the real estate bubble, uh, which culminated in the Evergrande Group for filing for bankruptcy in August 2023. There is a debt crisis, unemployment un among youth is at record highs. So China's economy is not doing well. It is progress. It is growing very slowly. It's nowhere kind of like the kind of growth it had in the 20 in the 2000s and the 2010s. That's the situation. The economy isn't doing great at all. And maybe they're fudging the figures and inflating the figures. Maybe the situation is worse than what they are showing it as. Then, as part of this trade war, we had the U.S. imposing semiconductor sanctions on China under the Biden regime. So in October 22, the U.S. implemented new export controls that targeted China's ability to access and develop advanced computing and semiconductor manufacturing items and items needed to manufacture and develop supercomputers and so on. So the Americans imposed restrictions on exports to, to China of semiconductors and uh, supercomputer manufacturing and testing equipment and components and technology and you know it was like a it was like a, essentially a nuke attack of kinds you know so china retaliated by implementing export controls on rare earth metals and uh, rare earth metals technology so there's this war going on but the us holds the trump card in this the us also made a very important move of moving the tsmc the taiwan semiconductor manufacturing company to the us there's a major factory that's come up in arizona there's a second plant coming up, uh, up in arizona there's a 10 plus billion US Euro factory that the TSMC group have committed to, which will come up in Dresden in Germany. This was done in August 2023, the commitment. So there's a third huge plant factory that will come up in, uh, in Germany. So essentially TSMC will have moved to the US and to Germany and essentially to the West. And therefore, even if China takes uh, Taiwan out, there will be no big loss, but the US will in mainly ensure that the, the Chinese essentially gain nothing. They will destroy whatever is there in Taiwan. So that's the deal. TSMC is moving to the West. It's, it's, it's essentially a fait accompli. Then the Chinese have been trying to de-dollarize the world um, they have these deals with the Saudis, with with Iran as well. Uh, the Chinese obviously are, are are hungry for energy, so they have made a, they've signed a big range, a big spectrum of deals with the Chinese, and they are trading in the Chinese. U uh, they they've signed these deals with the Saudis, and they're going to trade in the Chinese yuan. They have this huge strategic deal with the Iranians as well, in which they're going to be uh, trading and dealing in the Chinese yuan. So they're trying to uh, move away from the U.S. dollar. The Chinese are also divesting themselves of the U.S. debt that they own. So China's U.S. Treasury holdings have hit a 14-year low uh, and China is now buying up gold. China's gold reserves are at an all-time high. But there's bad news for China in BRICS, in the Belt and Road Initiative, the Maritime Silk Road, and much more. Before we get to that, let's take a look at today's sponsor, which is directly tied to the soaring global demand for gold. So the company that's the sponsor of this video is a gold production company, company in Canada called West Haven Gold. Here is their stock ticker on your screen. It's WHN at the TSX. Venture Exchange. So West Haven is a gold-focused exploration company. They are in the process of advancing a high-grade gold discovery on the Shovel Nose Project in Canada's newest gold district, the Spences Bridge Gold Belt. West Haven controls 37,000 hectares of land with four 100% owned gold properties spread across this underexplored belt. You can see the pro 
property the properties on this map their flagship shovel nose property that you see in this map is situated off a major highway it's in close proximity to power rail and large producing mines and it's within commuting distance of the city from the city of merit so all of this translates into low cost exploration that's a huge and unique strategic advantage west haven have one of the best properties to drill their flagship shovel nose property check out the numbers on your screen pause the video and check them out they are doing brilliantly well so shovel nose is a great discovery they are consistent in the discovery they are finding more and more gold and they are expanding this discovery this property and the emerging gold belt has the potential to host multi million ounces in the future similar to the hishikari mine in japan and like i said ap uh, apart from shovel nose west haven also have great projects in skunka north skunka creek and prospect valley they are still very much an exploration story with several targets on this large and very underexplored property there's tremendous potential upside and west haven are fully financed for 2023 with 3 million canadian dollars in cash and they have an additional 2.2 million dollars canadian in mineral exploration tax credits due in quarter 3 of 2023 and they have a great team with a track record of exploration and development success the management and the insiders are very aligned with the shareholders with 24% ownership and they are doing everything in their power to unlock more value for their shareholders So West Haven Gold are a great exploration story with several targets on this large emerging and unexplored gold belt in southwestern British Columbia. They are drill testing multiple targets in 2023, roughly 25,000 meters of drilling. They are fully financed. They have a unique and powerful strategically advantageous location. Overall, the upside potential is immense so check this company out do your own research as always do your own due diligence research this company research this stock diligently it's west haven gold here is the ticker on your screen it's whn on the tsx venture exchange check the company out for yourself there's more links and uh, details in the description below do your own research do your own due diligence so coming back to bricks now there's been brics expansion six new nations have joined brics but the big uh, big bang reform that you were going to see in brics that was expected was the announcement of a new brics currency that would be uh, based on gold and a basket of commodities a common brics currency that would be a big challenge to the us dollar that has not happened and that's not happened because india refused to be part of this India has refused to go ahead with a common BRICS currency. This is something that the, that the Chinese wanted, maybe even the Russians wanted. So this is something that uh, happened at the Johannesburg summit earlier this year. And in this summit, India refused to give China concessions. Uh, and then during the subsequent G20 summit, President Xi Jinping gave it a miss. Uh, he's never done that before. So that kind of portrayed China as a nation that's not really interested in the common good and the collective progress, especially of the global South. It portrayed it, it presented China as a nation that's not a very responsible nation. So Xi Jinping gave the G20 summit a skip. He was not interested in uh, in whatever was going to happen there. He, it was a huge success for India and China. Was kind of petty and jealous, and they didn't want to uh, to essentially add to that, perhaps, or contribute to that. And Mr. Xi Jinping did not want to meet Mr. Modi because of the te tensions that are ongoing at the India China in India Tibet border. He also possibly did not want to meet Mr. Biden. So there's a whole lot going there, and he skipped this major summit, and he did not get what he wanted from India at the BRICS. Uh, summit either then there's the fact that china has territorial disputes with everybody with every single one of its neighbors they have territorial disputes they have maritime disputes they have terrestrial disputes they engage in cartographic aggression they claim territory from all their neighbors they claim the entirety of the south china sea via the 9 dash or 10 dash or 23 dash line whatever it is these days uh they bully other nations they have even through their latest map through their latest cartographic aggression claimed 
territory that Russia owns, right? So they have reopened an old dispute that was supposed to be, you know, resolved. So that's what China does. They simply won't let anyone stay, you know, live in peace. Um, and the major disputes are obviously Taiwan. They claim Taiwan in its entirety. Uh, there's a dispute with Japan, the Senkaku Islands that the, the Chinese call the Diaoyu or something islands. Then the Chinese claim the entirety of the South China Sea and they claim ma major portions of Indian territory despite already occupying certain pieces of Indian territory illegally. Uh, that's something that, that goes back several decades. And recently in 2020, there was a deadly clash between India and China uh, in the, the, the Galwan Valley clash in which 20 Indian soldiers died and a larger number of Chinese soldiers died. So the border situation is tense. It's hostile. There are 50,000 troops on both sides who are staring each other down in extremely harsh terrain, extremely high altitudes, very cold and harsh temperatures, very hard to breathe there. But nevertheless, that's, going, that's, go, that's what's going on over there. So the four major flashpoints could be Taiwan, Japan, the South China Sea and the India-Tibet border. Um, then there's the fact that the Belt and Road Initiative that was the vehicle that was supposed to catapult China to super stardom, to super power status, the BRI, the Belt and Road Initiative, it is failing. First of all, we have had the Ukraine war, which has put a spanner in the works. So you, the BRI can no longer connect with Europe because there's this huge chunk of territory, Ukraine, that is under a state of war. So that's what has happened. The China-Pakistan Economic Corridor, which is a major component of the BRI, has completely failed. It's completely failed in producing any viable result. And part of it goes through through territory that Pakistan illegally occupies from India temporarily. There is that situation as well. Um Italy recently has announced that it is pulling out of the BRI. The Prime Minister of Italy, Mrs. Meloni, uh, Miss Meloni, she recently uh, informed the Chinese during the G20 summit this year, just a few weeks ago, that Italy is pulling out of the BRI. That's another major setback for the Chinese. Uh, they have been building the String of Pearls network as part of the Maritime Silk Road. The Maritime Silk Road is an, is an extension of that. So even that is not really going anywhere. Hamban Tota, the port that they built in Sri Lanka, has, has been a complete failure. Uh, so overall, nothing is going well. The, 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 these initiatives have, have sucked in a huge amount of cash, a huge amount of uh, resources, but they are not producing the results the Chinese want. And a large... Part of that is because of the fact that the world has kind of lost trust in China. Nobody wants to get too close to China. Everybody fears China. And they know that the Chinese engage in this debt trap diplomacy. I know that China lovers will 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 be unhappy with me saying that, but that's just a fact. Okay, so th there's the BRI that's failing. The Maritime Silk Road is failing. Then there is the huge problem of China's falling fertility. The total fertility rate, the TFR, China's TFR has fallen below 1.1 to, to have a population replace itself and sustain itself at the same, same population level. You need a TFR of 2.1. When you have a TFR of 1.09, that is a disaster. That's a catastrophe beyond imagination. It's something you cannot recover from unless there's a miracle from the gods and there is going to be no miracle from the gods. And this is a consequence of, first of all, the one-child policy the Chinese ad adopted in the second half of the 20th century. And then this was exacer exacerbated badly by the uh, zero COVID policy, the horrific lockdowns that they imposed on their citizens, and people just stopped having children. That was the only form of protest they had left to them. So the Chinese population uh, growth essentially is going negative, possibly. yeah. And the population is rapidly aging. And this aging population will be a permanent major drag on China's economy in the upcoming years. By 2050, the median age, the average age in China will be over 50. By 2100, the median age will be possibly over 60. And the Chinese population will be half of what it is today. So you'll have half the population and most of them will be over 60. 60. The average age will be over 60. That is a disaster. That's a disaster. And the economy is not going to do well at all in the long run. So if the US is going to be overtaken as the world's largest economy this century, it's going to be by India, not by China. China is not going to do to make it. It's not going to happen. But China's decline will be gradual. It will remain the second or third largest economy for decades. And it still has a massive military power. But this huge gap 
between its 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 declining demographic and economic strength and its expanding political ambitions and military ambitions and imperialistic ter- territorial ambitions may make china highly vulnerable to strategic misjudgments the you know memories of past glory or or fear of lost status could lead the chinese leadership and the chinese communist party down a dangerous path you know there's a high likelihood of war maybe there could be war this year maybe with taiwan or japan or india or even the us and if it's with the us it's going to be i don't even imagine that then let's talk about chinese politics how many officials have we seen disappear china's defense minister li shangfu has not been seen for more than a month now and before mr li shangfu it was foreign minister qin gang who went missing and he was eventually re- replaced by the former foreign minister wang yi in july rocket force commanders and military commanders have gone missing the it minister xiao yaqing disappeared in 2022 other people like hu jintao and jack ma have disappeared tennis players like peng shuai have disappeared xi jinping president xi who is now the emperor of china the de facto emperor of china he is cracking down on all potential or imagined political dissent during his rise and during his consolidation of power he has defeated and sidelined and marginalized all his rivals and now it appears that he is he has been gripped by paranoia and he is going after his supporters so there is a high likelihood that this is going to cause chaos and uncertainty and turmoil an instability within the chinese communist party apparatus leadership and there is a high likelihood that mr xi could be ousted at some point not too far in the future and that does not bode well for the world because it's going to be cause a huge amount of instability and you don't going to know how the chinese will the communist party apparatus will behave and what sort of leadership it will throw up and to what extent the army and the armed forces will be involved huge amount of instability and uncertainty that could happen that could happen it's certainly on the cards So China is in visible decline. It's not going to be the next superpower. It still has a very powerful military. It still is the second largest economy. So its decline will be gradual, but China is in trouble and things are going to get worse. And that could that will mean bad news for Asia and the world. We're going to keep a close eye on these developments. Thank you for watching and I will see you in the next video.